And so there are times where God will begin to illuminate things that were really kind of hidden for such a time as this. And what God showed me is how significant the table of the Lord is. And when I say the table of the Lord, you might be thinking I'm talking about communion. No, it's much more than that. When Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, I will come and, and what? I'll come and you'll have a table experience. Mm. It's so important for us to realize that God doesn't want us to just come and look at the back of people's heads in church. There needs to be table experiences. That's why we have a Discover CLC and there's a, a meal around that. It's a table experience. That's why we have a discover the truth. It's a table experience where the truth is illuminated around the table. We talk about the most important truths that we must believe. That's why we have a 301 table experience where we learn to discover our ministry, how God can use us. If you haven't been through 101, 201, 301, I want to encourage you to do that. And we will be coming forth with a 401 discover leadership before the end of this year. And so it's, it's important for us to recognize in Scripture the significance of table involvement. Around a table, just think about it. Most of us here wouldn't have grown up if it weren't for the table that we had around in our home. And we would sit around the table and things would come out around the table and sometimes we liked what came out around the table and sometimes we didn't like what came around the table. But the whole idea was to reinforce belonging. The table of the Lord is not just a place where we come to get fixed. God's going to fix what's broken to me. The whole idea behind the table of the Lord is not about performance because Jesus already performed for us and our righteousness is really a gift. The table experience is an experience where we come to belong. Where we just come to be with God, to be with his people, to, and, and to enjoy being there. Enjoy the fellowship of the Spirit, the fellowship with one another. And I think that there's, it's so sad because there's so many people in the church today that they're not getting that table experience, which is why once a month we're having friends to family. That's really a table experience where you come and you have refreshments after the service and, and, and get to know the people that are here and develop relationships with them. There's nothing God likes more than family reunion around the table. This morning, I want to talk about a story about a woman at a well. And it says, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Does anyone know what Sychar means? Drunk. Tipsy. Had too much. Isn't it amazing how God can bring us to a place of the most high through the worst high? What are we doing? We're trying to address something in the physical that's missing in the spiritual. Isn't that true? So he came to a city of Samaria, which is really a, a city where people were worshiping false gods. And the Jews looked down on the Samaritans because they were half Jew and half something else. And they worshiped all different kinds of gods and kind of mixed everything together. And they were near the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, thus sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now we don't know whether or not they're talking about Roman time or whether or not they're talking about Hebrew time. So it could have been either noon or it could have been daybreak at, at the end of the day. I think it was really around noon. But they, they really don't know. They really don't know exactly. But a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said unto him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me? Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. Never mind a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I want you to see here, there are intersections in life where we come for water and God has allowed us to be thirsty so that when we come to the place of thirst, we discover our spiritual thirst. The woman of the well said, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the, the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. Wow. I think it's kind of interesting. He's saying something to her he hadn't even said to his disciples yet. Don't you? But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So it's talking about salvation. The living water that gives our spirit new birth. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I might not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now you realize she was from Sychar, and it was probably a good mile, and mile and a half walk for her to come and get water in the heat of the day. And so she, she's probably thinking, boy, I, it wouldn't be bad if I didn't have to do this every day. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you, you have five husbands, and the one whom you were with now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. I, I thought it was interesting that he commended her when, where, where she was truthful. Isn't it just like the Lord to find good things in us that lead to better things? And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place we ought to worship. So there were two different mountains. One where the temple was and the other one where the Samaritans were. And there was this disagreement on how they are to worship and where they are to worship. And Jesus answers her in a way she's not expecting. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Now, I want you to understand, there is a thirsty woman here that is thirsty for e eternal life. And there is a thirsty Jesus here who is thirsty for the thirsty. Sometimes we, we look at people, and, well, they'll never get saved. You don't know how thirsty they are. And God is thirsty for the thirsty. And that's why a lot of times we need to be sensitive to the Lord because there may be people that we think are not interested at all. And they're right at a point where they're ready. To, they just need to hear the good news. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. John chapter 4 and verses 5 through 26. There's a lot to unpack in what's happening here at the well. But spiritual thirst is discovered and cultivated in the place of natural thirst. There are some of us here, we've been trying to get things and we've just been, not been successful. We've been tried this to be fulfilled. Well, if I could just get me a car, then I'd be happy. We get a car and we're not happy because now we've got to put gas in it. Well, if I could just get me an apartment, then I would be happy when we get the apartment and it's too small. Well, if I could just get my own home, then I'd be happy when we get our own home and we're not happy. We are constantly thirsty, but not fulfilled. Well, if I just had furniture for the house, then I would be happy we get the furniture and we're not happy. Well, if I could just get a dishwasher, maybe 
maybe I could just renovate the kitchen, then I'd be happy. We renovate the kitchen and we'd be happy. Years are going by and years are going by. Our natural thirst is crying out to us, telling us these things are not going to satisfy your thirst. You need an encounter with the living water. You need an encounter with God because there's a God-shaped hole inside of every one of us that only God can fill. And this woman at the well is discovering that Jesus, her Messiah, is the one that fills it's the very shape of what's missing in our life. What's missing in your life? Isn't that interesting that she comes from a city where everybody's considered, they, they've even named the city Tipsy. It was a place where people lived on the wild side of life. Anybody lived there before besides me? Yeah, we all come from Sychar, don't we? We all been Tipsy. When you've been drinking alcohol, what do you need the most? Why? Because you're dehydrated. The wild side dehydrates our spirit. And God is waiting for us to, to gather enough thirst to where we finally make the connection between the natural and the spiritual. Living on the wild side of life dehydrates you spiritually. And it can bring you to a place of discovering you know, God makes something good out of it. It brings you to a place where you discover that you really are thirsty spiritually. And your physical thirst got you on your mind on the topic, something's missing. More than water. The world looks to find fulfillment in abusing alcohol, being filled with the spirits, Jack Daniels or whatever is their choice, where the spiritually thirsty find fulfillment in worshiping God. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about with a woman at a well? What you really need is to have a worship experience with the Father where the true worshipers worship him in spirit and in truth. Why? Because there's no high like the most high. Jesus came to the natural place of thirsting looking for the spiritually thirsty. I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus was here today if he wouldn't be at a bar talking to people that were open there, but they weren't open anywhere else until they were there. Now, do I think Jesus would be getting drunk? Absolutely not. He was already filled with the Spirit, capital S. But he understands the place of natural thirsting can be a place where people discover their spiritual thirsting like the woman at the well. Just as this Samaritan woman who was totally unaware of her spiritual thirst. Well, how do you know she was thirsting? Well, I'll tell you how I know. Because she tried to drink from five guys. If I could just have, be, get married to this guy, I would be happy. And got married, she wasn't happy. If I could just marry this guy, I just need to get rid of this one, give me a better one. If I get that, then I would be happy. And after five of them, she gave up on the marriage thing and just decided she was just going to live with a guy. Think about it. Most people would have said, she's the spot as far away from salvation as anybody you're ever going to come across. But there was one thing she had going for her. She had a very thirsty appetite. And she didn't realize that sometimes people that have a real thirsty appetite for, for life and the wild side are the people that are most thirsty for the spiritual side. And that there's a parallel. Sometimes the people that are, are, are the, the best sinners make the best saints. So, sometimes the people that, when they're sinning, they're all in it. And then when they're in Jesus, they're all in Jesus, man. I'm, I'm ready to go for it because they have fierce appetite. And that appetite is not only in the physical, not only in the natural, but that appetite is in the spiritual. And what we're looking for in the church today are, is for a people that have a ferocious appetite, a ferocious thirsting, a ferocious hungering for the things of God and are willing to go after it instead of being satisfied with the morsels that the world wants to leave us and give us, instead of being intoxicated to... Uh, to distract us from what we aren't getting and aren't being fulfilled from that maybe are self-medicating us so that we can tolerate all the misery we have from the lack of fulfillment in our life that can only come through Jesus Christ. I better be careful. I might start preaching this morning. 
You see, the world looks to find fulfillment in abusing alcohol or drugs, being filled with other spirits. But there's a parallel. We need to see this. Instead of judging the world, we need to offer them the living water, like Jesus did with the woman at the well here. Jesus came to a natural place of thirsting to find the spiritually thirsty. At the natural place of thirsting, we're not always aware of our spiritual thirsting. Just as the Samaritan woman was totally unaware of her spiritual thirsting. You know, in the church today, it would be so much better if we would quit judging people that have been drinking the wrong thing and instead give them a sip of the real thing. God often uses our natural thirst to get us to a place where we can become aware. I don't think people are aware of their spiritual thirst. Wouldn't it be terrible if Jesus were to come back and there were a bunch of people that were thirsty that were just overlooked, that would have made the, the cut? But because we're looking at their abuse of the other thirst, we're not looking at their need for spiritual thirst. And sometimes I think the people that are messing up the most are missing something the most. And we're here to give them what's missing. Look at someone tell them, I got what's missing. What were you thirsty? What were you thirsty for and hungry for before you came to the Lord? For some it's fame. For some it's money. Others, it might be travel or success. You know, I, I see people and they got like five cars in their driveway. How in the world do you drive all those five cars at the same time? I can't figure that out. It's like you get one and then, it, no, that's not it. And so you get another one. Uh, no, that's not it. And so you get another one. Well, let's think, take a look at some boats. Oh, let, let's maybe a, a cabin out in the woods. Oh, how about something oceanfront? And isn't it amazing how the enemy can keep things in front of us and we're never stopping to think, why am I so empty? Why am I not being fulfilled by all these things? You know, when Jesus comes back, this whole world is going to be destroyed. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. Every fancy car is going to burn up. All jewelry will be destroyed. All homes will be destroyed. Everything everybody's spending all their time on will mean nothing. Go up and smoke. The only thing that will remain is that which is eternal. That's why God put in you and me a hunger and a thirst that all these other things can't satisfy that only worshiping and connecting with the living God will bring satisfaction in our life. Denise and I, we, we discovered that. We really wanted to be successful at a young age. We got married at 18. We bought our first house two weeks before we turned 21. And we did all kinds of things, but they weren't satisfying us until we came across a young couple that brought us to their little farmhouse in East Lebanon, Maine, where their parents lived, and, and we, we received the Lord around the table. Can you imagine that? A table, a farm table. I want you to understand, farmers do all kinds of things on their table that you just wouldn't like. <laughs> but there were things happening around that table that, that that didn't matter. What mattered is that we were tasting something we had not tasted. We were drinking something we had not drank before. That's the things of the Spirit. Jesus recognized the value of a place of thirst and asked the woman to give him water to quench his thirst. She was amazed because of what he asked from her. Isn't it, isn't it amazing that Jesus will ask things of us so that it will open up the door between us and him? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You got to open up. But when you do, boy, are we going to have a meal. To the Jews, Samaritans were considered compromised, unclean, half-Jews. They were to be shunned and avoided. 
to recognize that she had something of value to share was completely unexpected. You ever stop to think that people are offended when you won't receive what they offer? I remember when the Soviet Union collapsed and a bunch of pastors went over there to bring the gospel. And they welcomed them into their homes and when they pulled out the vodka, some of them like, I I won't drink that. I don't drink alcohol. And they were offended and for many of them, the, the door was shut. But there were other smart people like Rick Renner. When he was over there, he recognized that if you don't, let somebody share what they have with you, they're not ready for you to share what you have with them. And maybe you got to choke down a shot. That's enough. Just get it out of the way so that you can share the living water. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm telling you, the gospel came into that country amazingly. Does that mean we should abuse alcohol? No, what it means is Jesus was willing to receive something from this woman that was considered taboo. You're going to drink that after that woman gave it. That woman knows every man in town. And you know what I mean by no, like Adam knew Eve. Jesus recognized the value of thirst at a place of thirst and asked the woman to give him water. Then she would be open to receiving his water. Wow. That's why it's so important about the table. When we invite people around the table, Jesus told a story about this big feast being made. And they went out and invited all the rich people and all the good, unquote, citizens, and they had excuses why they couldn't come. And then finally, they sent them out in the highways and the byways and just compel them to come in, whoever comes in. But the others that rejected, they'll not taste of my dinner. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. There's all kinds of Christians today that do not value the table of the Lord. They don't value time where we spend together with God around the table of the Lord where we are giving and receiving. And we are not only having natural food, but there's a spiritual food that's being shared around that table. You see, when they had the table, in those days they had one bowl all the food was in one bowl and everybody had to serve themselves out of that bowl and they didn't have utensils so they would take a piece of bread and roll it up in a ball and make a scoop out of it they called it a sop and they would use that to put the food from that bowl into their dish and then they would sop up whatever gravy that was in there or sauce that was in there from that meal and that's exactly what was happening on the last supper when Jesus said the one that was going to betray him has his sop in the bowl you see it was around the table of the Lord that Judas was given a chance for reconciliation. It was around the table of the Lord that Jesus said that Peter was going to deny him three times. It was around the table of the Lord after Peter denied him. It was around the table of the Lord that Jesus restored him. With a little fire on shore and reenacting the whole scene where he was when he denied the Lord and there was somebody else around a fire. And Oh, aren't you one of the ones that was following Jesus? Oh, no, that's not me. And, and he denied him three times. And then Jesus is recreating that scene around the table of the Lord. See, the table of the Lord is a place where sometimes we can identify where we are because we're not there alone. Sometimes I need my brothers and my sisters around the table to help me see where I really am and where I could really be. They're sitting around the table and the Apostle John's got his head against the chest of Jesus because they lounged at the table. That was a, a custom that had been um, a, only about 100, 100 years old and they learned it from the Romans. And so when they would have their dinner meal, they would sit around the table and, and, and lounge and they, then... It was at that time that John put his head against the shoulder of Jesus. And when Jesus is restoring Peter, he's telling him, you know, another one's going to carry you a place that you couldn't go before because you denied the Lord to avoid it. There's, a, there's one that's carrying you and, and, and you'll, you'll fulfill your destiny. I'm paraphrasing here. And then what does Peter say? Well, well how about him? It's around the table of the Lord that we realized 
Oh, I'm jealous. How about John? What, what's up with, with John? What does it matter to you what's up with John? If I, if, if I wish for him to, to live and, and not be crucified, what, what's that to you? So he gave responsibility of his mother Mary to John. John was thrown into a vat of boiling oil and jumped out like the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> Didn't affect him one bit. Why? Because that was the anointing that was upon him. That was his purpose in God. And that's why it's so important around the table of the Lord. Don't be looking at other people questioning their purpose when you haven't really discovered your own. The table of the Lord is that place where God can help us to see the areas in our life that can be improved. He doesn't, you're not around that table for him to find something wrong with you. You're around that table for you to find something right with you. Not a table of judgment. It's a table of adjustment. Religious people often write off people that they consider sinners or unbelievers to their religion. And they don't hang around with thirsty sinners, but Jesus does. Jesus is attracted to those in a thirsty place who have unseen spiritual thirst. They hang out in thirsty places because they're trying to find fulfillment in the natural that can only be quenched by the spiritual. At that place of awareness of the natural hunger and thirst, that it can be the place where the spiritual hunger and thirst are revealed and exactly what happened with the woman at the well. Most people don't come to Christ in a place of fulfillment, but rather in a place of unfulfillment. Thirsting for a better life, better circumstances, a better marriage, a better relationships. Life seems to be evading them because life does not have the kind of water we need. Life does not have spiritual water. That only comes from the spiritual. We have to come to the place where we realize we need more than just natural water. It was there that Jesus brought the natural thirsty woman to life by giving her eternal water. Her dreams of better relationships, of a better life had evaded her. And only then, when she was satisfied with a dissatisfied satisfaction, did she look to the Lord for something that she didn't even know was available. Without the distractions of failed self-pursuit, she, she became aware of her need for spiritual fulfillment and water, her Messiah, Jesus for me, it was a failing marriage, loneliness, the desire for a better life, fear that brought me to Jacob's well of spiritual transformation. My natural thirst brought me to a place where I recognized my spiritual thirst for a life transformed and lived with the Messiah. God wants every one of us to have that woman at the well experience. In this story, there were both natural and spiritual hunger and thirst happening at the same time. You know, I see a lot of Christians and they're not hungry or thirsty. Not only for, for, for spiritual things, but they're not even hungry or thirsty for natural things. Jesus said they're lukewarm. God can do a lot with people of passion, but he can't do much with people that have no passion. The disciples had to get food for lunch to satisfy their own natural hunger while being unaware of their own spiritual hunger. If they were aware of their own hunger, they might have been there at the well with a woman. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with, why, 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 why didn't they ask him? Because they were distracted by their own natural hunger. Their own natural thirst. The woman then what do you seek? What are you talking to her? The woman then left her water pot. Now, this is really, this is a big deal here. You can't get water out of that well. That's why Jesus had to have her give him water without a pot. And this woman was so satisfied and fulfilled with her encounter with God that she no longer looked to find fulfillment in natural water. She left her pot and went her way into the city and said, come and see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him. Oh man, she, she got this ferocious hunger and thirst that was contagious. 
and everybody else had to come out and find out what it was. And this woman, she, she knew a lot of people in town. There was a big revival because this woman that had been with so many men and known by so many men, this woman, because of her involvement with so many people as a sinner, made a doorway for a lot of them to become saints. And there was a revival in Samaria. And I think that the, the, the revival that's coming is going to come around the table of the Lord. Notice the woman left her water pot, hungering and thirsting for others to experience what she had. Natural hunger and thirst have been overwhelmed by spiritual hunger and thirst. The disciples were oblivious to what was happening around the spiritual dinner table of the Lord because they were all focused on the natural dinner table. In their haste, they urged Jesus to come and eat. And Jesus said he had food that they didn't even know about. And they're like, I, where do you get food? We had to go in town, you know, in town into the city to get food to feed everybody. Where, where do you get? They had no idea. Still don't know he's talking about a different kind of food. And then he says, he, he explains that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. God help us to be as hungry and thirsty as the woman at the well to bring people to the table of the Lord. Which is exactly what she did. He warns them not to put their spiritual thirst and hunger off. He said, you know, don't say that there's still three months and then the harvest. The harvest is ready. If somebody's hungry and thirsty, don't wait until they die. You can't stay hungry and thirsty for three months. Don't put it off. Harvest results when we hunger and thirst spiritually and labor in the land of the natural hunger and thirst. And show them their spiritual hunger and thirst. The world, like the woman at the well, are unaware of their spiritual hunger and thirst until they are seated around the table of the Lord and fed spiritual bread and drink from the transforming waters of the salvation at Jacob's well. God didn't give you a table in your home just for natural food and drink. He's commanded us all to go and make disciples. The table of the Lord is where disciples are made. How many disciples have been made around your table? I think that's going to be critical to what God is doing and saying to the church right now. It's time to invite people into our homes. It's time to give people food and drink and then give them spiritual food and drink and help them discover their genuine spiritual hunger that comes from God. He didn't give you a table just to eat natural food and drink. He gave you a table where the naturally hungry can discover the spiritual bread of life. There's some of us here, we need to have table of the Lord more with our families. Where you come to the table and people aren't distracted from their hunger spiritually and their thirst spiritually because of their electronics. Or because there's a TV going. Sometimes it's just good to just shut all that off like they do on Blue Blood when their families come together on the TV series and, and, and they, they have to talk to one another. And if someone pulls out their phone, they get corrected. No, you can't do that right here. This is a time where we are at the table and we are consuming more than food and drink here. We are finding a place of belonging, a place of fellowship, a place of intimacy and openness Important things happen around the table of the Lord. Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep around that table. Didn't he? And part of his restoration. Let me ask you something. If Jesus is with Peter around the table, and he's feeding Peter spiritually around that table, restoring him from denying the Lord three times, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. What do you think he's talking about? Do you think he's talking about feeding the sheep in the pen? Or do you think he's talking about feeding the sheep the way Jesus fed the sheep, the sheep, Peter, right there and right then? The real feeding comes around the table. It doesn't come in the stadium. The real feeding is not happening in the sanctuary. The real feeding is happening when you go home and you invite people over and you're having a meal together and you talk about what we talked about in church and you begin to, it, you begin to consume what has been offered and it's able to be broken down around the table. I, I remember when I was a little kid and, and we, we were Catholic and a lot of the other kids that I knew when Sunday came around, the, all the family went to grandma and grandpa's house 
And the priest would even go there and eat with them. There'd be like 50 people. Everybody would bring food and everything. Everybody would have that time around the table. That's what's missing. It's, it's missing in the Catholic Church, and it's missing in the Protestant Church. It's time for us to realize how important it is for us to break bread together and to do it on a regular basis. I think it's going to be important as we go into this new season that we recognize the importance of the table of the Lord. You know, it's, it's when we go to our friend's house, Henry and Tamri, and we break bread together and we have time together. They crank out the jacuzzi in the wintertime. <laughs> and we go out there and we hang out and we talk and we fellowship. You know, bonds like that are going to hold you together when you might have conflicting beliefs in other ways. And if we'll be honest about it, there's no pressure here to make everybody have the same beliefs about everything, politically or what. What we want to do is make disciples, not Republicans, not Democrats. Are you hearing me? But it's around that table that any other things that could divide us cannot. Because we've been united around the table of the Lord and we have been connected in a way that we're not going to let the world separate us because that's exactly what they like to do. They like to get us into different camps and get us fighting with one another. Man, if we were having more breaking of bread together, I think we wouldn't have as much fighting together. Here we go again. I'm running out of time. Peter remembers the last supper table that he was at when Jesus said he was going to deny him. I'll die for you. I'll never do that. But he did it. The table of the Lord is where humanity is adjusted to spirituality. Where Peter gets beyond his failures. Where Peter begins to enter back into his destiny. The whole denial of the Lord was just God's way of dealing with Peter's pride because he thought he could do all things through him who strengthens him, not through God who strengthens him. And the only way that you're going to find out that you can't is by failing. The only way you're going to find out that you've been relying on natural thirst is when you run out of anything in the natural to satisfy. Man, I got so much more to share, but I'm going to stop here. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus is not talking about taking them out to a field. He's talking about taking them around the table. But how do you know that? Because that's exactly what he did on the day of Pentecost. They were having table time. When everybody got saved, the Bible says he exhorted them and they continued steadfastly in the doctors and the apostles' doctrine and prayer, breaking bread together, house to house. What are you talking about? Table of the Lord. The table of the Lord was a very, very foundational part of the great revival of the church first beginning. And we need to get back to that. We need to get to a place where nobody in the church feels like they can come in and out and feel totally lonely like so many do because they've not been having any table time. Table time is not a place where God is going to be dealing with your behavior. Table time is a time when God is going to help you belong. And your belonging will change your behavior. Sometimes we want to change our behavior thinking until I change my behavior, I can't belong. No, until you belong, you can't change your behavior because it's around the table that we begin to take on the strength and characteristics of those that are around us. It's around the table when we're walking in the light and having fellowship one with another that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It's around the table. It's not some isolated person walking, just me and Jesus. No, that's not biblical. That's not what happened in the Bible. And God is calling us back to that place where we are willing to spend some time around the table with our families, where we're willing to share the Lord with our families in that time around the table. You know, your, your family, your kids, even as they grow up, they're going to have problems and they're going to need help. I'll tell you, I've been having a lot of table time lately. And sometimes that's just with one or two of them at a time. Our kids need us. 
And we need to see the value of table time, belonging time, connecting time. I'd like us just to bow our heads for a moment and I want to ask you, is the Lord speaking to you about more table time? Maybe he, he needs, he's knocking on the door of your heart saying, if you'll open up the door, I'll come in and we'll have some table time. We will sup together. The Lord is speaking to you to open that door of your heart. Will you respond to him today? Pastor, pray for me. I want to open up the door to my heart for the Lord to come in to my life. If that's you, would you raise your hands? God bless you. Many hands going up. Praise God. Maybe you're here today and you're having fellowship with the Lord, but you're kind of isolated and God is really convicting you this morning that you need to be having table time with other people. Go to their home. Have them in your home. It's time to open up the kingdom to your home. Open up the kingdom in somebody else's home. If that's you and say, Pastor, I need, a, I need to do more of that. Pray for me. That you just raise your hand. God bless you. Many hands going up. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to bring me to your table. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you for your righteousness that I can bring to the table when I don't have any of my own. But I can be just like I was perfect because Jesus was. <laughs> Hallelujah. Je Jesus, come into my heart. Help me to find a place around your table where we can enjoy table time with you and your family. I received your living water bubbling up in my soul and I see my need for more time dining around your table and I commit to spending more table time time with you on a daily basis thank you for the gift of salvation thank you for wanting to spend time with me not just to fix me but to fulfill me with your presence. Feed me with the bread of life and the water of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen.